Like an embarrassing jumper knitted by your favourite grandma, Colossal Cave is made with love, care and affection, but you probably wouldn't want to be seen wearing it in public. Taking inspiration from the quintessential text adventure of the same name, Colossal Cave 3D updates 70s-style adventuring with a crisp, clean, early noughties makeover, boasting some of the lowest resolution textures ever seen in a modern console game. The graphics are poor even by PS2 standards. A text adventure being limited only by the imagination of the player can conjure stunning vistas, hard to replicate by a small team of artists, an elderly couple on a boat, and a Unity asset store. The technology is out there to render this world in all its glory, but unfortunately for Sinus Games, the budget wasn't up to the task. If the game's purpose was to evoke a nostalgic response, it did so rather unintentionally by reminding me that Jaggies were once a mainstay in early 3D games. Luckily, the game maintains the text descriptions in the form of an excellent narrator. However, his elegant prose doesn't always match the blurry mess of polygons that the protagonist sees before them. These engravings are beautiful and enigmatic. You briefly wonder who created them. The Perhaps the worst offender is the pirate, who had me genuinely questioning whether my Nintendo Switch had itself walked the plank. <laughs> I'll just take all this booty and hide it away with my chest deep in the maze. Where the graphical frailties become terminal is in the map feature. Players of the text adventure may scoff at the notion of not drawing your own map, but since Colossal Cave 3D has such a feature, it would have been preferable if the words were readable. It's not entirely useless as it effectively replicates the feeling of needing new reading glasses. For what purports to be a reimagining, the game ironically leaves far too much to the imagination. The world and our reason to explore it remain a mystery, as does our quest, which apparently concerns the accumulation of precious artefacts and coins. Our task is to find them and earn points. Bringing said items back to the wellhouse at the beginning of the game garners more points, but none of this is either explained in game or incentivized by some kind of character motivation. Jewelry. Even once you have probably by chance worked out that this is what the game wants from you, you are then pitted against the game's main antagonist, a random number generator. At any moment, a poorly rendered pirate or a ground-dwelling mole dwarf might pop up and randomly steal your booty, or throw a knife at your head. You can vanquish or intimidate little tosses by carrying around a small axe, but said axe fills up precious inventory spots, which for some reason are at a premium. If you're unlucky, the RNG will take you out altogether. There are threatening dwarves here. Knives are thrown. One of them got you. Oh dear. You seem to have been ousted from your adventure. I might be able to help, but I've never really done this before. Do you want me to try and resurrect you? Random deaths, dead ends, and having to drop inventory to collect new ones have been tried, tested, and ultimately banished from gaming in the years after Ken and Roberta Williams retired. Someone should have told them. The saving grace is that the puzzles are relatively logical for the most part. Using oil on a sticky metal door makes sense, but deploying a bird to attack a snake, slightly less so. The little bird attacks the green snake, and in an astounding flurry, drives the snake away. The interface too is simple and effective, giving you only two verbs, look and use. Knowing when the look function will give an overview of the room and when it will home in on a specific object takes some trial and error. The most incomprehensible cardinal sin though is the mazes, which even if they had a purpose would be excruciating, but as they are they make traversing the labyrinth a nightmare. Wit's end consists of a ladder and exits which all lead back to the same ladder. The narrator instructs you to not give up, as if you have a choice if you want to proceed. Then offers a hint in exchange for points. In one maze, the hint was to leave stuff on the floor to make the room look different. How about your artists do that instead, game? I started this review with an analogy of your grandma's jumper, and it's something I stand by. There's some enjoyment to be had exploring the cave. I enjoyed this moment with the bear in particular, as you free him and have to defriend him on all your social media accounts so he doesn't follow you across the bridge. It has charm, but so did many of Sierra's games back in the 80s and 90s. Some modern gameplay trappings in conjunction with the passion for the project 
could have made this something special. As it is, if you want to play a more modern version of Colossal Cave Adventure, there's always this. You see a breathtaking view. Far below lies an active volcano from which gobs of molten lava surge and cascade to the depths. The glowing rock bathes the cavern with a blood-red glare, feigning a macabre appearance. The air is dense with sparks of ash, the smell of brimstone, and walls too hot to touch. The thundering volcano is so deafening it drowns out all sounds. Embedded in the jagged roof far overhead, Twisted formations of white alabaster scatter the murky light to become sinister apparitions upon the walls. On one side, you see a deep gorge encasing tortured rock that seems to be crafted by the devil himself. To your left, an immense river of fire gushes from the volcano's depths, then flows through the gorge to plummet into a bottomless pit. On the right, a huge geyser of blistering steam erupts from a barren island within a bubbling sulfurous lake. Above, the wall flickers with a glow of its own, lending more infernal splendor to an already hellish scene. 